staff get a lot out of watching and discussing the programmes. I benefit too because I can use the meetings as evidence towards high level teaching assistant status. Spread the word. Become a Teachers TV associate. Now, are we giving children too much too young? Should we be more focused on school readiness rather than reading and writing? Dispatches reports. Some parents spend thousands to make sure their children get it. Others struggle to do it at home. But tonight, Dispatches reveals that something we've assumed is good for our children could be harmful. Making them read and write too soon can cause permanent damage. A few weeks ago, you were three, not much more than a toddler. Now you're four and suddenly grown up, because now you must go to school. It's strange and not a little scary, but it's also exciting. A whole new world of learning is about to open up. Or is it? You find yourself under pressure to carry out tasks which seem beyond you. Pressure to read before you're ready. Pressure to write before you're able. Hang on, because we need to leave a space. For the first time in your life, you experience real failure. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. It's an experience from which some children never recover. Tonight, we present the results of a two-year dispatches investigation into what's happening to our children. Tomorrow, copies of our report will be sent to every MP and to leading educationalists around the country. It warns that up to 40% of our children may be being disadvantaged by their early experiences at school and that a large proportion of them are being permanently damaged. It warns that even our brightest children may be falling behind but above all, it asks the government and Britain's education authorities to explain why our children can't do what these children can. These are inner city kids from a poor area of the Hungarian town of Niragaja, near the border with Ukraine. They didn't start school until they were six or seven, and they've only been learning to read and write for a few weeks. Yet already, their progress is putting British kids to shame. And by 12 weeks, he's gone from this... 12 weeks ago, in the right through to this. Yes, that's right. She's very quick. Richie here is, um, he's not particularly good, he's uh, average no. or this is not the star? No. <laughs> ah, no. Yeah. 1,000 miles away as the crow flies and immeasurably distant in terms of social expectations, Bruges in Belgium. This school serves an aspirational middle-class area of the city. It's the Middle England of Flemish Belgium. Here, too, they don't start school until they're six or seven. But then they are expected to learn to read and write in just one term. Cook. Cook. S. How long has, has Anne's been reading? Uh, no, she's in her fourth month. So ah. she's, she just started from uh, 12 weeks ago? Yes. And already she's reading sentences? Yes, she, she does it very fine. Is, is um, she the best girl in the class or is she no. average? No, just the average. She's not. They are better ones and they are 
slower ones. Slower ones, uh. yes. Zurich in Switzerland. And here there's something which makes their achievements all the more impressive. These kids too have only been learning to read and write for 12 weeks. But because many are from the families of immigrant workers, no fewer than 16 of the 21 pupils here have had to learn a second language, Swiss German. Um, that's for example Deria, which is from Turkey. That's Sabrina from Switzerland and Eleni from Greece. And because Swiss German is only a spoken dialect, they've had to learn to read and write in what for most of them is virtually a third language, High German. Sri Lanka and Alain from Portugal. Yet by just after Easter, they will be expected to read and write with reasonable fluency. It's quite impressive. Yes, uh, but that's the way it goes in Switzerland. In maths, in all three countries, the achievements are, if anything, even more dramatic. Last May, dispatches conducted an experiment. We took an arithmetic test, known as the SATs, which every child in England and Wales has to sit at age seven. We translated it and gave it to this group of Hungarian seven-year-olds from a very typical inner-city school. It's a group of average children. There are very good, excellent children, there are very weak children, and there are average ones. So this is a very typical range of, of children in the school. Of course, our small experiment certainly couldn't be seen as conclusive, but the results were undeniably astonishing. In Britain, only 18% of children reached the top level for this paper. Here, 50% reached that level, even though they'd had two years less teaching than British kids of the same age. The contrast with Britain is stark. Over large areas of the country, like here in East London, half of all 11-year-olds are unable to read to the basic level expected of them. Some one in five hardly read at all. So what on earth is going on? What are we doing so wrong? The answer is startling and flies in the face of everything that the British government and the education authorities are saying. We are sending our kids to school a good two years too early. It's a situation regarded with near despair by teachers from here in East London who've been over to the successful countries and seen what they're doing. Because when those teachers were abroad, they made a remarkable discovery. It's not what happens in primary school which makes all the difference. It's what goes on before. It's what goes on in nursery. And that suggests that our commitment to early formal schooling is seriously misguided. What's wrong with starting early? Surely that's a benefit. Well, it isn't, I'm afraid, although one might think so. The problem is that we miss out a crucial stage before formal education that they have. We know that because we've been over, we've taken teachers over there, and we've seen what they do. What, what do you mean, we miss out a stage? Well, it's a whole stage getting children ready for formal education. Well, our kids spend their early years struggling to read and write, and their teachers struggle to teach them. What's going on in Hungary with kids of the same age? Well, quite a lot, actually. They're learning the basics, the things that people here believe have to be in place well before they learn to read and write. And the first of those skills is how to listen. These children are three and four. They won't be going to school for at least another two years, but here at kindergarten there is a great deal to learn. The children are learning to distinguish what's important from the babble of noise around them. Playing simple games like this is the first stage in a structured and progressively demanding course that lasts three years. Indul. 
In other successful countries, it's the same. Though for these older kids, the game is more difficult. The teacher plays four similar sounding instruments behind the curtain of a model theatre. The children must remember the sounds and arrange a second set of instruments in the same order. Finally, to find out if they've got it right, the teacher pulls back the curtains. Britain's failure to take such exercises seriously worries speech and language therapists who have to deal with the consequences. I don't really think anything very much is being done to enable children to listen. If you can't focus your attention on listening to something and tune out the background, which is something that we as adults are doing all the time without thinking about it, if you can't control your attention, the focus of your attention, then you're miles and miles away from being ready for formal learning. The next thing they regard as of key importance in Hungarian and indeed European preschool education is teaching cooperation and social skills. This is a story about how a fox took advantage of two squabbling bears. The need to collaborate with others and the cost of not doing so is taught systematically. A year ago, Sandor here had a speech problem and was crushingly shy. In Britain, he would have gone to school with his problems unresolved and faced a future of educational failure. Here, he's been able to stay an extra year in kindergarten, his problems are disappearing and his confidence is growing with every day. In fact, learning to work confidently with others is seen as crucial for all children. But in Britain, the teaching of such skills is at best hit and miss. We don't give the social skills um, enough focus. We have to ensure that children know how to socialise with other children. That, to me, is the bedrock of social interaction. And if we don't teach those skills, children are isolated, um, potentially throughout their school lives. Another thing they regard as central to kindergarten education in Europe is the kind of thing going on in this room. It may look like play, but actually it's part of a series of carefully structured exercises in mathematical concepts. The children are also taught an awareness and understanding of space. And they're taught an understanding of quantity. The children put counters on the tree, one for each time the teacher claps. Progress is monitored and anyone who needs it gets individual help. Here, a five-year-old is taught that four objects remain four even when spread out. Children are not introduced to written numbers until they understand completely what those numbers represent. The, the, the oneness of one, the twoness of two of understanding really what you're doing when you take away a set of objects from a larger set. These sort of things need to be developed very carefully. Now, the problem is that uh, um, what we tend to do in this country at the moment is to focus in on recording. In other words, children writing numbers far too early. Um, before 
those crucial uh, concepts have been fully established. The recording gets in the way of learning the mathematics for a lot of young children in this country. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think there's that one to be finished. Why is it so wrong to teach kids to sort of, you know, learn sums, to learn that two from four leaves two? Because they don't know what two means. You can teach them tricks. You can teach them um, how to work out any, any sort of sums but by doing a trick but they don't actually understand. There is no understanding behind it. If you said to them, well, what does that mean? How did you do that? How did you come to that answer? Then they wouldn't be able to explain it. But by far the most important thing they teach in all the successful countries is spoken language. <laughs> Here, in a Swiss kindergarten, a child has to describe items hidden in a basket with sufficient clarity and detail to enable the others to guess what they are. Teaching confident, precise speech is at the centre of the learning process. It's very different in Britain. It's not developed systematically enough here. We often think that children are talking to each other and developing the skills of speaking and listening. In actual fact, very, very little of that's happening. Children actually, when you look at it, often simply work or play on their own. They don't relate to each other. So these crucial skills are not being developed. Children need to have a lot of practice at talking. Um, we have a situation in this school where almost 10% of our children have language problems and we feel it's because they haven't had enough practice at speaking and listening and discussing. In European kindergartens, they don't just teach speech, but the actual makeup of spoken language. The ability, for example, to distinguish the different sounds in words. In Belgium, a teacher calls out the separate sounds that make up a child's name. The class puts them together and the child joins the line. It's all seen as an essential preparation for reading. Children are helped to understand what it is that letters represent before they're introduced to them. and the children are prepared for writing just as carefully, drawing patterns in sand as part of a process designed to ensure they have the necessary physical dexterity before using pencil and paper. The one thing they don't do here is formal instruction in reading and writing, the very thing on which we put so much emphasis. And they don't do it not just because they think it would be a waste of time, but to force the pace with kids who aren't ready to do it is positively dangerous. They are not at all allowed to read, to do arithmetic in, a, in, a, in the nursery school, it's something for the primary school, but not in the nursery school. Emotionally, they are not prepared to do that. I think it's not good for the children. And not just emotionally. These children are doing exercises designed to help their early motor skills. To compel children to write before these skills are in place would be regarded here as nothing less than cruel. In fact, in the early 80s, they conducted extensive research to find out just when children were physically ready to write. Some of them are ready at five. Most of them, it's six. When, when they reach the six, and about 15% uh, of them, even after six years, can't write, not ready for writing, until seven. In a second experiment, the Hungarians tried to see if they could speed up the development of the necessary fine motor control. Is it possible to accelerate this or not? And it was a, 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 a complete uh, unsuccess, failure, complete failure. 
We were convinced if the fine movement coordination, motor skills, is not developed, then it's not possible to, to teach writing. It's, uh, it's for a child, it's uh, a very difficult problem to do these exercises. If we will push the child to do this, then uh, he will hate the exercise and hate the school and everything because they can't do it. Yet all too often, that's exactly what we do to British kids. We're asking children to do things that we know they're not really ready for. For example, you'll see three and four year olds um, trying to hold a pencil, trying to write their name, and that you can see they haven't got the dexterity to hold a pencil. They haven't got the physical development to actually do that task. They can't do it, they're not ready for doing that. They haven't got those skills in order to do it. We're turning children off, which is causing children to fail, um, causing them to underachieve, and causing some behavior problems as well. I can't do it. I can't do it. But Britain's educational establishment clearly has little sympathy for that view. Last year, the School Curriculum and Assessment Authority told nurseries in England and Wales that they should teach three- and four-year-olds to... Write their names with appropriate upper and lowercase letters. Recognise familiar words. Associate sounds with syllables, words and letters. The paper was called, ironically, Desirable Outcomes. Children can feel very inadequate. We have children here who... Um, are on an, an at-risk register, really, because they're failing at a very young age. Now, in Switzerland, these children wouldn't even be at school. They see other children that have already made a start on reading. They see other children that can write their names. They can't. That, of course, is very difficult for them. And um, they immediately have the idea that they've come into a place where they don't belong. Education is not for them. Butterfly. I don't think they're don't butterflies, are they? Start it again here, look, please. The children were making... What do you see? What could they be making with flour and salt and sugar? I've seen children looking utterly bewildered, completely bewildered. They know that the adult requires them to do something and they clearly feel absolutely horrible because they know that they can't do it. They don't understand the task and I think many four-year-olds will not understand the task. And what's the future for them? It could be educational failure on a very long-term basis. But for government, the drive is for ever earlier and greater demands. Last year, the School Curriculum and Assessment Authority published a new test for all children entering school called Baseline Assessment. It'll apply from this September. From then, children barely four will be assessed to see if they can... Read familiar words in a range of contexts. Attempt to write sentences. Attempt to spell unfamiliar words. Abroad, what Britain is doing is viewed with nothing short of disbelief. I think it's not a good thing to uh, prepare the children at that way at four to read, to, to do mathematics. There. A child is not at the age of four or five ready to do that. I would say it's not normal. <laughs> no. It's crazy. They are not up to it. They, 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 uh... It's too young. Yes, much mm. too young. In Britain, the man in charge of Ofsted, the body responsible for standards in schools, disagrees. The vast majority of children are capable of learning their alphabet, of the sound correspondence with the letters, of being able to write their own name or the names of other children in the class. I think it is perfectly reasonable and indeed desirable to expect the most children to make that kind of progress. The more you expect of children, the more by and large they will achieve. But you couldn't find higher <coughs> expectations than you'll find in, in, in some of the schools we visited in Belgium, in Hungary. Um, those, those teachers there have very high expectations and by and large they meet those expectations better than we do. And yet when I said to them, we start teaching them to read at four, at five, sometimes even at three, 
Um, one, one Belgian teacher said, that's not normal, it's crazy. Well, I disagree. Um, I think that there's plenty of evidence in English nurseries and English primary schools of children mastering pre-reading skills uh, and skills of basic number at four uh, and in reception classes at five and that that is providing a secure and good foundation for all their later learning. Unfortunately, our evidence paints a rather less rosy picture, but it may hold the key to why boys are failing and show why even our brightest children might be disadvantaged. Now I'd like you to feel this and look very carefully and see if you can describe something about it for me. Let's start with Alfie. What can you tell us, Alfie? It's like a flat bit. Good boy. Pass it on to Rihanna. <laughs> It's a funny shape. These children in a primary school in East London are learning to use their own language. Each one has to find a new way to describe the fruit. It's an exercise which gets more and more difficult with each turn. This is known as circle time. The children here aren't just learning to use their language, they're learning to concentrate, use their memory, take their turn, and listen carefully to their friends. How can you tell it's slightly squashy? In some of Europe's most successful education systems, where these techniques were developed, this would be part of a systematic learning process designed to develop basic skills before children begin formal lessons in reading and writing at six or seven. But not here, despite the best efforts of these teachers. Good girl, Ellie. Um, we have introduced it here, um, but we do find that we're still under pressure. We have to do the formal work as well. And um, we're not brave enough, I suppose, at the moment to say, no, we're going to throw out the formal work because we can't do that because we have the national curriculum to think about. What is to stop you in this school saying, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to do reading and writing until later. We're going to learn these basic skills first. Well, we can't do that because the government says we've got to do the national curriculum. And the national curriculum is founded on the assumption that reading and writing should begin as early as possible. Indeed, Ofsted, the official body in charge of standards at school, has just put out a video for teachers which says that nurseries should teach children to read at three and four. Hassan's <laughs> letter. Hassan. I'm sure it has two of these letters in it. In the successful European countries, they would regard this as very damaging. But the head of Ofsted, Chris Woodhead, is unrepentant. I do reject that. I think that the reading and writing skills can begin positively and constructively with four-year-olds and five-year-olds. And I think we are missing an opportunity. We are wasting time if we don't do that. When we're inspected by Ofsted, you know, if we're not doing what we should be doing, <laughs> we'll be a failing school. I think teachers feel very frustrated and quite upset about it. You say that you don't believe in forcing children to do too much, but if you look at baseline assessment, which makes certain requirements of kids um, as they start school to read simple text, to spell un unfamiliar words, that must be surely putting pressure on nursery teachers to make kids jump through those hoops. I'm not interested in children jumping through hoops, but I am interested in raising the expectations of nursery teachers because I believe that children can achieve more than we have expected them to be able to achieve in the past and I am saying that structured systematic teaching can deliver that progress. Because we all feel the pressure, because we have inspections in schools, because we know that um, we're going to be judged by um, results at the end of the day, that we're actually being forced to do something we don't believe in and it's very difficult to resist that pressure. Well, it's a challenge to some nursery teachers, yes. I am arguing that this is a drive to raise expectation. And if expectations are too low, then teachers are going to feel uncomfortable as they adjust their expectations. But um, I'm not uh, apologising for that. 
In fact, teachers who fear that what they are compelled to do is damaging children are actually winning increased support from across the political spectrum, including that of a man once seen as Margaret Thatcher's favourite educationalist. And much too much is placed on the plate of the teacher, on the plate of the pupils at an early age, without adequate concern for the proper gradation, proper consolidation of fundamentals. That's something that you will not find abroad. Limited curriculum, complete mastery, 80% or more of the children must know it thoroughly. So what we're doing is, is too much too soon? Clearly. That fear that by asking too much too soon, we could be causing long-term damage to children as young as four is borne out alarmingly by the statistics. We are failing, in particular, the bottom 30 to 40 percent who do significantly less well in international comparisons. Indeed, many appear to have given up almost completely. So many find it difficult, get discouraged, get discouraged because they can't do what apparently is there to be done. And having got discouraged, the interest wanes and a greater fraction than elsewhere, then drop out. But perhaps most alarming of all is the evidence about boys. It's known that young boys develop more slowly than girls. So if it's true that we damage children by sending them to school too early, then it follows that boys are likely to do particularly badly. They do. Indeed, international studies in 29 countries around the world revealed only six, including England and Wales, where there was a marked gender gap, that boys did worse than girls. What distinguished each of those countries was that they all started their children at five rather than later. Something is going on in early years education in countries which have entry at five rather than six which is not producing equal attainment between boys and girls at nine. The lesson is clear. Boys are even more likely to be damaged than girls by early formal lessons in reading, writing and arithmetic. But it's a lesson the government seems reluctant to learn. Because just two weeks ago, when new figures hit the headlines showing Britain's gender gap continues to grow, Education Minister Stephen Byers responded by pledging yet more early instruction in reading and writing. The very thing the evidence suggests played a key role in causing the problem in the first place. What that's going to do is to spread children out even further. We're building in failure for those children right from the start. Um, uh, before they, they, they start uh, education, um, they're failures. Um, and our society really, uh, I, th I believe, can't function in that way. The consequence, of course, is that those who succeed and those who fail are not even measured by intelligence. Those who are developmentally ready do well. Those who are not may fall into a spiral of decline so profound it's been called the Matthew effect, after Matthew 13. Whosoever hath, to him shall be given, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away. It's that phenomenon, more than anything, which many hoped that a new Labour government would want to tackle. But what teachers are saying, and it's a very, very serious charge, is that by increasing our emphasis on reading and writing at an early age, it's not just a waste of time, but it's actually dangerous. Things like the gender gap and so on will actually get worse by what you're proposing. Well, I'm saying two things, and the government is saying two things. One is that we should address the needs of individual children, and we should accelerate their potential if they're able to take that on with confidence and self-esteem. And where there isn't, we should be taking counterweighting action urgently at the earliest possible stage to ensure that what's available, to put it bluntly, in middle-class families with the capacity uh, to be able to support their children at home in all sorts of ways, not just in early reading and writing, but in the way in which they express themselves through language, that we make that available to other children as well. If you accept that, do you accept the possibility that it could actually be damaging and dangerous to force children to read and write before they have those those talking skills, those listening skills, those, those concepts in their head? Not for those who do have those, for, those language those skills. Well, what I've said and what I repeat 
is that I think these two go together. In the meantime, the government seems determined to continue its drive for early formal instruction in literacy and numeracy. Although they've got absolutely no evidence that it's going to work, they feel it's just common sense. Uh, uh, they feel that this is perhaps what parents want. You're suggesting it's a populist response to... It might well be a, a populist response. They think that they can make some political capital out of it uh, instead of looking to see what really works, what really will raise attainment levels in this country. Ironically, in Mr Blunkett's own constituency in Sheffield, one initiative might yet show the way. In a project initiated in association with dispatches and in direct response to our investigation, Sheffield Council is seeking funding to run a dramatic experiment in three local schools to reproduce the approach of the successful continental countries. It would be led by educational psychologist Anne Locke. I think the concern of teachers, the evidence from international studies, I think all of this is so strong that we really must have a trial here to look at the impact of this approach on educational performance. I think the reason it's so important is because it could address that fundamental problem of underperformance later on. We would very much like to see this work being trialled in Sheffield if we can find the funding in order to do so, and we will try to do so. Teachers say there are two reasons why a Labour government should throw its weight behind the trial. The first is that it involves a commitment to a system which aims as far as possible to keep children together and ensure they all have an equal chance. That approach is what unites all the successful systems abroad, whether they serve the aspirational middle classes of Belgium or the workers emerging from Stalinist rule in Hungary. And it's an approach based on the belief that it doesn't just benefit the least able, but the group as a whole. How important do you think it is to keep children as a group working together and experiencing and learning together? absolutely fundamental, not only for success in the early years, but for success later on. If we manage children as the group, then the group will create a momentum for itself in terms of language, which will serve the needs of all children. So what we're talking about is important potentially, not just to the less able kids, but to the bright kids as well. I think to all, all young people. And that's the second reason that many people feel this whole approach should appeal to a Labour government because all the evidence from the successful countries suggests that keeping kids together and even involving the brighter kids in helping the less advanced certainly doesn't harm those bright kids and may even help them. We've no evidence at all that um, early acceleration of reading necessarily means that they're going to be the best and the brightest at, in, in the secondary years or into university. There's some evidence that, that, that pushing children, in fact, isn't good for them, that moving them laterally, giving them um, work to uh, expand the, th the level at which they're currently working, is as good for them in terms of their intellectual development as pushing them on all the time. Clearly, our educational problems will not be solved until the authorities are prepared for a fundamental rethink of their whole approach. And for many, that reappraisal can't come soon enough. Not least for the man who was effectively the architect of Hungary's educational success. What is your reaction to the fact that in Britain we start teaching children to write at the age of four or even three? I, I really can't understand what is the aim of this and why uh, you are trying to do this. It's against the, the biological development of children. Uh, 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 all our measurement shows that it's, it doesn't help, or it's, uh, uh, sorry to say a very hard word, it's dangerous. For many of Britain's most committed teachers, that evidence will merely add urgency to their already passionate appeals for change. The research is, is overwhelming that this is the right thing to do. We know, it's our gut feeling, 
we who work with these small children, that this is the right thing to do. It's time somebody said, yes, you can do it. Release us and let us do it. <laughs>